nightmare to see that speed and ability coming at you. His shot was incredible. Probably the greatest defenseman to ever lace on a pair of skates. He was the greatest hockey player I ever saw. And since 1936, right through to 55, I saw a lot of him. The greatest hockey player who ever lived, Bobby Orr, and I love him. Sanderson a drive, and that one whistled wide. Ori for the Bruins, tied up by Ecclestone and Berenson. Westfall rolled it in front. Sanderson tried a shot that was wide and keen and cleared it, but not out. Bobby Orr behind the net to Sanderson. To Orr! Bobby Orr! Scores in the Boston Bruins! behind the net to Sanderson, out in front to Orr, and Bobby Orr made no mistake in beating Glenn Hall. If a picture represents a thousand and words, this famous shot Glenn represents Hall. a thousand amazing feats in the career of the hockey player most considered the best to ever lace up a pair of skates, the incomparable Bobby Orr. Hello, I'm Ron Hewitt. It was a sad day for hockey when Bobby Orr officially announced his retirement from active play on November the 8th, 1978. From the outset, he proved himself a leader, winning the Calder Memorial Trophy in his rookie NHL season, followed by numerous honors, including eight consecutive James Norris Memorial Trophies, three Hart Trophies, two Art Ross Trophies, two Conn Smythe Trophies, the Pearson Trophy, the Lester Patrick Award, and the Lou Marsh Trophy as top Canadian athlete in 1970. And along the way, he scored more goals and more points than any defenseman in NHL history. And he also led the Boston Bruins to two Stanley Cup championships in 1970 and 1972. Now, for the next 80 minutes, we're going to relive some of the best moments of Bobby Orr's outstanding National Hockey League career through selected game action highlights, comments, and observations from other celebrated individuals in the world's fastest game. You'll see how the young kid from Perry Sound, Ontario, became a hockey legend. Campbell, the president of the National Hockey League. It took 29 years and Bobby Orr to bring Stanley Cup mania to Boston. Yet Bobby had been in the NHL just four years and his legend was still growing. The Bruins have won the Stanley Cup for the first time in 29 years. Music brings that cup down to the other end of the ice. He wants all the fans to have a look at it. In an injury-shortened 12-year Hall of Fame career, he lifted the game of hockey to new heights, changed it forever. He was the first defenseman to become a consistent offensive threat, controlling the game like no other before him, and no other since. Bobby Orr did it all. Skate with supernatural speed and grace. Pass with uncanny precision. Shoot with rifle-like accuracy and howitzer power. Defend with tenacious courage. And hit like a truckload of bricks. Number four, Bobby Orr was the best. A man whose outstanding talent remade the game of hockey and garnered many honors. None more satisfying than these words from other hockey legends. When Bobby came into the game, he became a rushing defenseman. He became a, a goal scorer. A point getter. He just opened the game right up to more offense and uh, that's the way the game is played now. Overall, I can very safely say uh, Bobby impressed me more than anybody with his tremendous talents. He's the best player that ever that ever went through here in my you know, 26, 27 years as coach, manager, etc. He would drive to the net injured, he would drive to the net hurt. He played that way every night. Well, the first thing that usually when I see Orr coming down at me and that, I'd probably try and say a little prayer if I had time. I think the greatest change in hockey uh, would be uh, the arrival of Bobby, and it's the mobility of defensemen. He never lost sight of the fact that he had played minor hockey. He was a youngster that asked for autographs. He always had time for people around him. Bobby Orr was the greatest defenseman ever played in that game, as far as I'm concerned, and I think he I believe this in my heart. He changed the face of the game. What do you call a man who transforms skating skill into an ice ballet? What do you call a man who seemed to know what an opponent was going to do before he did it? Gets away from Hextall. On the move. Bobby Orr. Gets by Sather. 
What do you call a man who played with supreme courage? What do you call a man who played for his teammates and his team, never for himself? What do you call a man who took an old game and remade it for a modern era? What do you call a man who redefined the meaning of grace under pressure? Gets by Ron Harris. Orr's got the puck. Cuts through. Fires. Go! What do you call a man who now sits at the highest level among the heroes of hockey? The open man is Sanderson. Takes the pass. Right in front. A great what do you call a man who has become a legend in everybody's eyes but his own? You call him Bobby Orr. The boy from the small Ontario town who became a giant in the world's fastest, toughest game. Bobby picks up speed as he swings the net. Gets by one man. Ahead for Derek Sanderson. Sandy. De Laurent. Out front. Shot at the post and it's tied up right at the post. Out to Esposito. Back to Orr. In the corner. Stanfield. Back to Orr. Fakes a shot. Pulls it around Nestorenko. Going in. His shot. Bounces over the net. Stanfield trying to work it back to Esposito. Orr has it. Gets it on his forehand. He drives. Wide of the net. McKenzie. Looking. Working his way in. His shot. Block. Goes out to Esposito. He fires. Stopped by Tony Esposito. And he hangs on. Busick to Orr. He drives. Stopped off on Busick. Oh! It's Mullins ahead for Bobby Ho. Bobby Orr back in the Boston zone on the loose puck. Kept in by the Chicago Blackhawks and Gotti. Runs right into Orr and down he goes. Across to Orr. Orr shifts on hold of the back through. Got And here comes Orr. He's got running room. Tries to Esposito. Go! It's 5 to 1. And Esposito has scored his second goal of the night, his 17th of the year. Bobby Orr picks up his second assist. Puck is loose. McKenzie has it. 45 seconds left to the penalty to Bergman. Orr fires. Go! Cashman as the boy is gone up. Bobby Orr. Up to Hyde. Back to Orr. His shot. Oh. Time of Bobby's goal comes at two minutes and ten seconds. Orr breaks out with Sanderson. Two on one. Reed is back. He's got Sanderson with him. Holds it to Sanderson. Back to Orr. Way up. Way up. So, ball out by New York here. Nobody in their net. Drive by Park goes wide. Or long shot and it scores! Harry's sound isn't exactly the center of the hockey universe, but it didn't take long for the hockey world to notice a young phenom named Bobby Orr. Ren Blair is known for his abilities in discovering and nurturing hockey talent, especially for the Boston Bruins. He knew right away that Bobby Orr was special. When I first saw him play in a Bantam playoff game in Gananoque, and Lynn Patrick and Weston Adams, the owner of the Bruins, and uh, Hap Ems and Harold Cotton, Milt Smith, all came down to our playoffs and stayed there all week. And I had told Lynn on a, on a Friday night, there were a couple of kids on the Gananoque team I had been watching, and I asked Lynn if he'd like to go over with me. About three minutes into the game, Lynn was standing down the far end of the corner of the rink, and I walked down to him and I said, you know, forget those two kids in Gananoque that I asked you to come over and see. I said, there's a kid on that Perry Sound team that's out of this world. And he said, that little guy number two on defense, which is the number he wore that day. And I said, yeah, he said, isn't he something? I said, boy, I can't believe this kid. Two days later, I was in Perry Sound. Hall of Famer Milt Schmidt was with Wren and the other Boston Brass on that remarkable day. What a find he was. He was only 12 years old at that time, and you could tell at that particular time that he was, by far and away, one of the best prospects ever in the National Hockey League. There was no doubt that Bobby Orr would one day play in the NHL. 
Who we would play for was the question, a big question. I spent a rather frustrating two years waiting for him to become 14. I always joked that during those two years that every time Arva came out on the back porch to shake her dust mop, I was sitting on it waiting for Bobby to come home from school. Because I felt that, uh, that it was very important to build up a relationship with Bobby. The Rangers, the Leafs, they were all after Bobby. But Ren Blair was like a terrier. There was no way he'd let go of a future franchise player like Orr. We used to, in those days, hold junior tryout camps. So that summer, I was able to get Bobby to come down to that camp. He just dazzled everybody. It was at that camp that future teammate and close friend Derek Sanderson first saw Bobby in action. I said, how good could he be? He's 129 pounds. Uh, but he was, a, he was a rocket then. He could fly. He could handle the puck. And gritty. A lot tougher than people ever thought he was. To get Bobby Orr, the Boston Bruins bankrolled the return of Junior A hockey to Oshawa. Ren Blair convinced the young star and his parents that playing for the Oshawa Generals was the right decision. And Bobby took the first step toward becoming the greatest Boston Bruin in the history of that storied franchise. Bobby, the one thing I know that you've appreciated over the years because you talk about it so often is the love and support that you received from your family when you were playing hockey in Perry Sound and had to leave at age 14. It was difficult. I, w I was very young. Um, I don't know if you've ever been homesick or not, but I can assure you <laughs> uh, it's a terrible feeling. That first year was awful. So now you're going to play junior A hockey, Bobby. You weigh 126 pounds. You're a young, skinny kid, the youngest of all the members of the team. Did you have to try harder to make the team, to play against the others? I wasn't really thinking about proving anything. I wanted to make the team. I was going to go there and, and, and uh, you know, tr try my hardest, uh, try to play my best. I was being given an opportunity uh, to play a game that I love to play, uh, to play a game that I dreamt about playing. From the time I started watching hockey, I could uh, remember the Maple Leafs and the Canadians skating around center ice with that Stanley Cup, and I wanted to be part of a, a team and uh, do just that. Jim Peters, a close friend of Bobby since his early days with the Oshawa Generals, recalls the Phnom's arrival. Well, I can remember first day of training camp. We'd heard about Bobby Orr before, but when we go on the ice, within five minutes when he had the puck, we knew who Bobby Orr was. He was the man. For two years, Bobby's was a road act. The Generals' home games were played at Maple Leaf Gardens and in Bowmanville. But in 1964, with the opening of the new Civic Arena, the people of Oshawa got to see their junior superstar up close. His mentor, Ren Blair, appreciated Bobby's humanitarian qualities off the ice, but on it, he wasn't quite so sure. I used to get on his case. He'd, he'd go through the whole team, go around the net, and then give the puck to some kid who only had three goals, you know? And that kid would, would miss the net half the time. And I would say to him, why do you do that? We're trying to win the game, you know? Oh, he says, we were up six to two anyway. I mean, what's the matter, you know? Those who played against Bobby knew how good he was, including future teammate Derek Sanderson, then a center for the Niagara Falls junior team. We had our goals because I was a defensive sentiment, a checking sentiment, and Bobby obviously was the offense wherever he went. So my role was to shut him down. And I used to stand in front of the net and say, no, you can't, no, you can't. And I used to yell at him behind the net, I'll get you. Uh, but Bobby was, he was just so fast. He had so many moves. He had that little pirouette move. Uh, he'd lead you to believe he was going to move the puck. And he'd look off that way and dish it back in. He could move it, then he would break. You couldn't catch him. And he would get back into a hole. And he was, he was, he was almost unstoppable, as, as, as unstoppable as any player I've ever seen. In Oshawa, Bobby had four great all-star seasons, but his team never won the ultimate prize, the Memorial Cup. Bobby, it's 1966. You know you're going to the Boston Bruin training camp. It's in London. You're going to play against the big boys now. This is your opportunity to make the National Hockey League. How did you feel? When I received the invitation to go, obviously I was thrilled. Uh, I knew that was the next step, uh, the Bruin training camp, to go, go and see what I, what I could do. Um, I remember going to London to the to the motel, and I was given a key, and I, I walked in my room, and, and there was a player laying on the bed with just his underwear on. Uh, his nickname was Buddha. <laughs> a little bit of a, 
Tommy on him, uh, our captain, John Busick, and I remember looking at him and saying, uh, oh, hello, Mr. Busick. And he looked up at me and he says, you don't call me Mr. Busick, you call me John or Chief. As Bobby Orr arrived in the NHL stage, an era was ending. This was the last season for the original six-team league. Next year, expansion would remake the face of hockey, just as Bobby was about to remake the way the game was played. And when Bobby Orr laced up his skates in his patented barefoot style, he became otherworldly. I never knew a player before or since that could go from standstill to just flying with about four strides. If anybody had, had told anybody prior to Bobby, do you know within the next three years, a defenseman's going to win the NHL scoring championship? They would look at you like you're out of your mind. And yet, that's what Bobby did. And I don't know if anybody ever will again. Just 18, not even fully grown. Bobby Orr quickly proved in that amazing 1966-67 season that at any age, any size, he was already a man among men, a man to be reckoned with. The Bruins had missed the playoffs the previous seven seasons, but the young rookie number four quickly turned the team into a contender. My first game was against Detroit, and uh, Gordie Howe, he, he was the man. <laughs> and uh, I can remember in that game, first of all, coming to the rink, I was here at one in the afternoon for a night game. Uh, nervous, uh, excited, and this is the next step, and heck, I'm playing a game I'm, I love to play and I'm being paid to do it, and I was you know, just so, so excited, but uh, I think Gordy wanted to let the kid know that he was still around. I was watching, <laughs> on one play I was watching my pretty pass, and someone, I didn't know at the time, who, the player that hit me, but it was Gordy, and uh, I think he was trying to give me a little reminder about, you know, your kid, You've got to keep your head up in this game. First time I played against him, as a matter of fact, uh, for some reason, maybe he anticipated a comeback of some kind, but he laid the lumber on the back of my head. I turned around. I said, I hit that little pimple-faced kid, you know. When I came in and I circled left when he passed the puck, I circled right when he passed the puck. And the third one I didn't circle, I ran over top of him, and uh, all of his old buddies come running to him. And the remark that the young man made, uh, said to me, there's a guy not only with tremendous talent, but a great mind. He just simply looked at him and said, gentlemen, relax, I deserve that. Another legend of the game and one of the great Montreal players and gentlemen of all time, Jean Beliveau, knew he was watching a new game when Orr was on the ice. He looked so young. I remember our first few games. We all have heard about him, what he did as a, as a junior. Uh, and it didn't take long before we realized uh, this uh, great uh, talent, this great natural ability. And as everybody realized very quickly that uh, what a great uh, skater and playmaker he was at the same time. Jacques Lemaire, then a future star with the league-leading Montreal Canadiens, got an early view of a legend in the making. He just came up and played like a, an experienced guy and he was uh, controlling the game uh, nearly as good as he was in the, with the juniors. When I played, uh, I do remember it. it was not too many guys that I couldn't catch when I wanted. One guy that I couldn't catch was this guy. You had to go on him in a different way. You had to think about, he's got a lot of moves. He's got speed. He can make you look like a fool. So you had to be careful. Bobby Orr got a hold of that puck. He got everybody out of their seat. They were on their feet continually. Very exciting player. He really worked at it. That's what we Never mean got the control. marks that he should have had defensively. Ahead for Bobby Hall. Sure, he was an offensive uh, defenseman, no doubt about it, but he was always back there when he needed to be. He had the knack getting back in time to stop the play from going into our zone. It's true, Bobby redefined the role of the defenseman, from pure defender into offensive threat. But Bobby's offense flowed out of a fluid, give no quarter defensive ability. In any sport, there are only a select few who are able to see not only what is happening, but what will happen. Bobby Orr was one of that select few. They talk a lot about 
peripheral vision in hockey, and Bobby was one of those players that was blessed with excellent vision, where that he would look straight ahead, but he would see behind him. Uh, I think he also had a kind of a sensory perception of where other people were. He would look up, make a quick check off, and he'd say, okay, now he knows where everybody is, or where they could get to before he moved seven, eight feet, how much could they close in on? And I think he had a feeling of where everybody was. He certainly had a feeling where his teammates were. Bobby Orr. To Sanderson, going in, Sandy. Psycho! A great move by Sanderson. To create something out of nothing. To see possibilities where others see only chaos. To make a stunning move that no one has ever made before, instinctively, perfectly. A move that brings a roar of appreciation from the crowd and a grunt of disbelief from an opponent. To do these things in the heat of battle, at intense speed, in the midst of flashing blades and bruising bodies, that is art raised to its highest level. Bobby Orr created within the game of hockey the way a Picasso or a Rembrandt created within a field of canvas. And the way we look at the world and the game has never been the same. again to believe it. Now you just watch Orr here and Busick combined for this goal. Orr is down on the ice. Now watch this play here. There's the puck. Now here it comes. And there's Busick cutting in from the left wing doing what he did just a moment ago but he caught Jill Bear going halfway and he just tucked it between his pads. I had been a defenseman throughout my career uh, as well. Uh, with a very limited skating ability and, and, and had always wished that I could have uh, lugged the puck like I saw this young guy doing it. And uh, everybody could see immediately that this was something from which to build a team style around and, and, and a team a game plan and a concept and, a, and an identity for the type of team you were. And uh, uh, he was just so talented and throughout his career that you, you could not invoke a system to restrain him. You, it would have been the most foolish thing anybody could have done. Bobby learned the lessons of the NHL in an unnatural hurry. In his first year, he scored 41 points and won the Calder Trophy as Rookie of the Year. Scary for the rest of the league when you consider that his best years were still ahead of him. Bobby, one of the biggest trades occurred in your second year with the Boston Bruins. It shook the team, but it was one of the best moves ever made by Boston Bruin management. And that was the huge trade where Esposito came to the Boston Bruins. Tell me about that as far as your reaction to the trade and how it worked out in the building of the Boston Bruins. The Bruins had some very good players here. Teddy Green, uh, Dallas Smith, uh, John Busick, uh, Johnny McKenzie. Pretty good hockey players. And then the trade. And that's... That's really what turned. When you can get three players uh, like Stanfield, Esposito, and Hodge that step in, and, and I don't think anyone, uh, you know, Milt Schmidt made the deal, and I, I don't think Milt really thought they were going to play like they ended up playing, but they became superstars in this, in this league. So when you can put three players in, mix it with some of your kids, mix it with uh, the veterans that are already here, uh, that was a start. But those three players from Chicago, Esposito, Hodge, and Stanfield, no question, that was a turning point uh, for this team. In the 1967-68 season, Bobby Orr and a revamped Bruins team made it to the playoffs for the first time in eight years. Along the way, Bobby Orr collected his first Norris Trophy and second All-Star selection in an injury-reduced season. He also indelibly changed the game with his rushing style. Bill Waters has had a long-standing personal and business relationship with Bobby. I often said that when he was on the ice, you were sure of two things. One, that the puck was coming out of your end, automatic. And then when it came out of your own zone, you knew there was going to be a chance on that because Orr was going to create it. Yes, Bobby was doing so much to elevate the game of hockey and the play of his team. Bobby bled Bruin yellow and black. And in 1968-69, he brought them one step closer to Stanley Cup glory. That 68-69 season was a, a, a very important season for us. We, we learned a lot that, you know, you know they, what does they say about losing? You, you can learn a lot from losing, and we learned a lot uh, from losing that season. And then the following season, we, 
we did win the Stanley Cup. Everywhere you looked that year, number four Bobby Orr was there. In his third NHL season, he was already a cultural icon, a social phenomenon, and the rest of the league was paying very close attention. There was only one way you could stop Bobby Orr. And every time he was on that ice, the opposition would be playing a man short. They would have to have a man planted on Bobby Orr continually. That would be the only way that if you went to bed with Bobby, that's the only way you could stop him. I don't think you ever stopped Bobby Orr. You contained Bobby Orr, but you never stopped him. Um, he was too talented and, uh, and too great a, uh, a player to ever, ever stop him. So we, basically what we tried to do, we tried to contain him. And you, normally you did that with, you know, by, by sending two and maybe three guys and, uh, on him. And, um, and you figured that if, if Bobby gave the puck up, it was a good play. Terry Crisp is a Perry Sound native like Bobby Orr. He also played against Bobby before beginning a strong career as an NHL coach. Heading down to the Boston zone, and who was there to look you square in the face and break up the play was Bobby Orr. Who was the first guy down the year end leading the rush? Bobby Orr. Who was the guy making the play from behind the net? Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr was ushering in a new era for defense. It was the dawn of a new era for hockey and most especially the Boston Bruins. The end of the 68-69 season saw the Bruins bow out in the Stanley Cup semifinals to the eventual winners, the dynastic Montreal Canadiens. And once again, Bobby Orr garnered the Norris Trophy and an all-star selection. He also upped his scoring total to 64 points on 21 goals and 43 assists. Numbers unheard of for a defenseman. Gets it out to Orr. He fires. Go! But for Bobby and the Bruins, the best was yet to come. Bobby Orr's fourth year in the league was to be one of his greatest. He set new standards for defensemen that may never be equal. He fires. And the tremendous ovation here at a capacity crowd at the Boston Garden continues for young number four, 21-year-old Bobby Orr. And Bobby is visibly affected by this fine round of applause. They appreciate good hockey performances here in Boston. Bobby gets around. Jim Peters still has it from the line. Goal! And that's the record breaker. Bobby Orr has broken the record for most goals in the season by an offenseman. His 22nd goal of the year. Goes it around Howe up to Sanderson. Back to Orr. All of a sudden, he's got running room. Getting around Harris. Moving in. Scores! It's 3-2, and Orr has scored a short-handed goal. His 100th point. That's Bobby Orr's 100th point of the season. No other defenseman in the National Hockey League history has ever done it. Orr gets around Collins. He's got running room. Passes to Westfall. His shot. Go! It's one up in Boston. A new record by Bobby Orr. He's eclipsed Phil Esposito's all-time assist record. And it's a standing ovation here at the Boston Garden for Bobby Orr. No player in the history of the National... The man who had the best view of this superstar during that momentous season were his coach, Harry Sinden, and teammate Phil Esposito. He was the game-breaker and the game-winner for us, whether he scored or whether he didn't score, but in some fashion... Uh, if we could keep it close, uh, uh, at the end, Bobby would find a way to help.